The Eyes of the Skin, written by Yohani Palazma, is a book dedicated to the sensation of buildings. The author Yohani Palazma is a Finnish architect, architectural theorist, designer, and teacher. Although he believes that more senses should be cooperated in the designs, Palazma in the book puts forth the idea that visual elements are the most important in architectural designs and the understanding of them. Relying more heavily on the haptic realm, like Palazma suggests, would detract from the way that each of the senses should be used together to face human existence and shape the way that space is experienced. The eyes and sight are at the top of the hierarchical system of senses, for the eye is the center point of the perceptual world as well as the concept of self. The gradually growing hegemony of the eye seems to be parallel with the development of Western ego consciousness and the gradually increasing separation of the self and the world. Vision separates us from the world, whereas the other senses unite us with it. The dominance of the eye above other senses is what pushes us to be detached. If architects only use sight as a sense, it would limit their work. The visual aspect of architecture is all around us, but it is too easy to settle for just sight. The spread of superficial architectural imagery, which lacks a sense of empathy and materiality, is cancerous, as philosopher Michel de Certo said. If they only depended on sight as a sense, they would only have form rather than function, ornamented buildings that would please the eye but not smell, touch, allow for the community to hear or even taste. Form will follow form. We experience so much more than just the visual aspect of a building. That is Palazma's anti-ocular centrist main point. Isolate in a cool and distant realm of vision, entering the backside of the moon, Naoshima tests your sight as a whole. The first dark room fills with pockets of light, its experience is far more interesting. Experience the four other senses. Sight is useful, but should not be considered the most important sense. The other senses should not be neglected. Vision becomes a limitation. The growing hegemony of the eye is parallel with the development of Western ego consciousness and increasing separation of the self in the world vision separates us from the world while other senses unite us. Following visuals, haptics, the sense of touch in relation to perception and manipulation of objects are key to understanding the world at a more physical level. An object can be seen one way from an illusion, but the truth can be discovered by touch. Haptics in architecture can be the handrails on the stairs to the buttons in the elevator. It helps bring emotion and connects us with the building. It also can create a more user-friendly building and even make it more engaging. However, this does not mean adding haptics to all architecture would make it better. Haptics makes the world around us more engaging. It tells a story through time. As Plasma said, the skin reads the texture, weight, density, and temperature of matter. The weathering of bricks, the smoothened marble of the staircase railing, the warmth of the sun hitting one's skin, they all tell the story of time, creating emotion in an individual. With each step within architecture, the individual is putting their mark on the architecture, changing the haptics. Haptics is a part of architecture, it cannot be stripped away. Although subconscious and unnoticed, people rely on haptics to understand the world better. Hand in hand with visuals, it gives us a more real information about the architecture, creating a space that can tell a story and give a structure emotions. The question of the role of sound in human life was set hundreds of thousands of years ago, during the time when the very first nomadic tribes were formed. At the time, the element that sustained tribal identity was sound, which determined the rhythm of tribal life and strengthened ties between tribe members. This may have been particularly visible under the cover of night, when with the total reduction of visual aids, the tribe's resonant music determined its zone of influence. Nowadays, sound continues to play a major role in the daily lives of people around the globe, and it can even play a role in art and architecture. Every move in a space makes a sound. The material used, the configuration of objects, the shape of the room, or its height. This can influence how a space is perceived and how it makes someone feel. For example, a warmer and more intimate design of a room is just as much about the acoustics as the colors of the objects in the room. It's perceived more comfortably because there may be spaces covered with carpets and curtains where sound disperses without echoing. Despite being often overlooked, oral architecture and architectural acoustics undoubtedly have a huge significance in spatial design, especially in creating an atmosphere by controlling how sound is experienced. As Plasma says, buildings do not react to our gaze, but they do return our sound back to our ears. Hearing structures articulate the experience and understanding of space. In his book, Experiencing Architecture, Sinai Rasmussen agrees, bringing up the question of whether or not architecture can be heard. In response, he argues, most people would probably say that as architecture does not produce sound, it cannot be heard. But neither does it radiate light, and yet it can be seen. We see the light it reflects, and thereby gain an impression of form and material. 
In the same way we hear the sound it reflects and they too give us an impression of form and material. Differently shaped rooms and different materials reverberate differently. A great example of this auditory realm in architecture is the Danish Music Museum. In this museum, architects have shaped, perforated, and padded each room's timber-lined walls to enhance the sound of strings, brass, percussion, or a full orchestra in the space. It exemplifies how a structure can be shaped in order to enhance the viewer's auditory experience. The scientific term for the sense of smell is olfactory, which is derived from the past participle of the Latin olfacere, which means to smell. In chapter 11 from the book Experiencing New Worlds, Smell, Person, Space, and Memory, they make the key observation that a smell-neutral space does not exist in nature, that all spaces are always filled with smells produced by the components of the environment, influenced by climate and human actions. Smells have the ability to evoke vastly different emotions in different people simply because of the vastness of human experience and the importance of olfaction for the perception of space and place lies in its power to evoke emotionally charred memories. The power of a scent only has power if we emotionally connect to it. Palasma writes that significant architecture makes us experience ourselves as complete embodied and spiritual beings, followed by the description of lending emotions to a space, and the space will lend its aura. This all-encompassing feeling that Palasma describes when being in a significant space is the same feeling we feel when we smell something that sends us into our memories, something that's almost debilitating because of how powerful it is to our personal selves. The sense of taste has a spatial quality and can be very confusing in a sensual atmosphere. A perfect example of this would be Ed Ruscha's chocolate room in the American Pavilion. Chocolate has organic compounds that combine to create sensory properties of taste, aroma, and mouthfeel, which produce similar desirable effects. Ruscha designed the space to lure people in with the scent of chocolate, but deprived people of satisfaction, for there was nothing to be physically consumed. A space covered in sheets of chocolate is ultimately a metaphor for physical desire that connects to emotional and sensory values. Palasma's most significant point on the sense of taste is that certain colors evoke oral sensations. And for example, he states, delicately colored polished stone surface is subliminally sensed by the tongue. This can be tied to an interesting phenomenon, synesthesia, which occurs when the simulation of one sensory or cognitive pathway leads to another. Some people can taste colors or see images when they hear certain sounds. This is typically an involuntary sensory experience, but nonetheless something to think about when it comes to human interaction with architecture. Being able to design a space that isn't merely visual or that is transformative in relation to our senses heightens one's appreciation for such architecture. Our understanding of the world around us and our experiences within it relies on the use of our five senses, the sense of sight, touch, taste, smell, and hearing. This also applies to how we experience architecture and the daily spaces that we inhabit. In the eyes of the skin, Palasma states that life-enhancing architecture must address all five of the sensory realms simultaneously. Architectural experiences are multi-sensory, and how we absorb and understand a space relies on the use of these. Matters of a space, whether it's scale, materiality, or density, are all measured equally by our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and skin. Experiencing architecture involves all five realms of sensory experience interacting with each other simultaneously, not just the separately acting five classical senses. Overall, each sense has a unique application in architecture. Sight can create distinction between the building and self, touch allows for the physical understanding of the architecture, sound can produce emotions for a building, smell can trigger memories, and taste acts on hunger and is able to lure people through spaces. While Palasma argues touch is most influential and history points to sight, it is essential to use each sense in their own effective way, while still using them in relationship to each other to create unity in architecture. Perhaps we often look only with our eyes. Instead of looking at the same time also with hearing, smell, taste, and touch, the sight does not have to be limited to only looking.